Hi everyone, a warm welcome to our webinar doing business in Asia, current trends, challenges and opportunities. I can see some familiar faces, also some new ones. My name is Tobias Kerkhoff and together with my colleague and the founder of Wannabe International Business, Mario Schäfer, and of course our two keynote speakers, I'm going to host the event. Joining us on today's webinar are Leong Si Wong, partner at Silk Road Corporation, and Charles Drapas, owner of Willex Bike Accessories and Rainwear. While Leong Si is a consultant with focus on finance and business development, and due to her decades of experience, she has an excellent understanding of Asian and European business cultures in international ventures. Charles is a successful Dutch entrepreneur who is going to share his practical insights of doing business for more than 30 years as a Hong Kong resident. Welcome to both of you. Basically, the webinar is, is scheduled for an hour and is divided into three parts. Since Asia is a complex and diverse continent, Leong Si will start with an introduction of the region, taking a closer look at the world's largest free trade zone, promising industries, challenges and benefits, macroeconomic data, and a forecast for the future. In the second part, Charles is going to present you his business case of Wolex, his experiences as a Hong Kong resident, the current situation in Hong Kong, challenges and opportunities. Finally, you have the chance to come up with your questions during our Q&A session. In the meantime, due to our time limitation, please let the keynote speakers finish their talk. Feel free to take notes and ask your questions as at the end of today's webinar. Thanks for your understanding. And now I'd like to hand over the word to Leong Si. Hi. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Leong Si, and I'm from uh, Silk Road Corporation. We are based in uh, Hong Kong, and uh, we uh, conduct business uh, from east to west uh, via Hong Kong, either towards uh, China or towards the Southeast Asia. So today, uh, we are going to talk about doing business in Asia. When we think about Asia, we always think about China, we always think about you know, uh, Japan, maybe India, but some of you maybe to, towards Thailand, but uh, uh, Asia is bigger than what you think. Yeah, let me show you. Does it, does it go down? Okay, Asia is this big. This is the continent of Asia. Yeah, so the fun fact about it is that it is home to uh, about 60% uh, of the world population, yeah, with 50 nations in it. Yeah, out of uh, out of all these nations, the combined population alone in India and China is about 30% of the world's population, yeah. Um, for in terms of trade, um, Asia, uh, accounts for 35% of all goods exported and 43% of the world's uh, uh, import. Yeah. But out of this nation, which uh, which countries do you, uh, do, uh, do we usually think that is the most important in, in Asia? Actually, for me, I think the RCEP region. RCEP means uh, is the... Uh, is the, this region is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. This is a free trade agreement between ASEAN plus five. So uh, ASEANs are the countries around uh, the Southeast Asia, plus uh, China, Japan, South Korea, Australia, and New Zealand. This, uh, this region alone is home to 30% of the global population, even without India added in. Yeah, this uh, region itself accounts for 30% of the global trade. Yeah, this free trade uh, zone is important uh, because um, this is where you can, uh, it is something similar to the EU bloc. So this is uh, this uh, free trade agreement have decided to do some uh, tariff reduction. So. I think the reduction for uh, some tariff is up to 92%. That means the, they are going to trade um, exact, almost the same as how the EU trades with each other. Yeah, And they are also harmonizing in their uh, rules and regulations, especially in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property. So uh, if, it, uh, if you apply for one country, it applies for all countries here. So that is also very important. The most important uh, benefit that comes from it is because 
within this region itself, you can uh, have uh, better market access to everything. There's less barriers uh, of trade be between all these countries and naturally the improvement of supply chain. So let's just, for example, if you import something into Thailand, you pay once a tariff and then the, you can then move it around uh, this uh, region without tariffs, yeah? So why is Asia uh, important? Because the purchasing power is now moving south, yeah? With uh, the biggest purchasing power in 2030 belongs to China, and the second one goes to India. So these two countries alone uh, eat up uh, the biggest purchasing power in this world, yeah? Also, that the GDP that is contributed by in 2050 will mainly come from uh, from Asia, yeah. And uh, why is this important? Because with uh, this kind of purchasing power, that means the consumer uh, 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 class is growing. So in next uh, this year alone, yeah, there will be 130 million people entering the global consumer class. What does it mean by that? It is someone that spends about $12 uh, dollars per day buying up goods, yeah? Out of all these uh, uh, people, the 113, 91 million new consumers will come from Asia, yeah? Biggest one will come from India and China and uh, followed uh, closely by uh, Southeast Asians and uh, South Asia, for example, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Pakistan, Philippines. These are the biggest, biggest uh, consumer class. Yeah, Indonesia and Bangladesh, they have the, the most expensive population pyramid. That means that on the bottom uh, end, uh, that means the, the young uh, population is the, uh, is, uh, uh, is the biggest. And that means they have a growing labor force and that uh, equates to more, consu uh, more consumers, yeah? So countries like, uh, for example, Vietnam, Philippines, or Thailand, or even Malaysia, uh, yeah, these are where e-commerce uh, markets are the fastest growing in the world. Yeah, and uh, what is what are the fastest growing industries in Asia? Let's have a look at it. So the fastest growing industries in Asia, the biggest one is actually gaming. Gaming is a big thing in East Asia, especially uh, countries like. China, Japan, South Korea. These are very, very big in gaming. You know, I, I've seen even movies made out of uh, people playing games. So that I, I, I would say that is a leading uh, technology there. Also because everybody has a smartphone. I have never seen a child without a smartphone. So <laughs> I think gaming is very, very big. The next thing that is very big uh, in Asia is actually e-commerce, yeah? E-commerce is really, really booming. As for, even uh, for countries like Indonesia, uh, it allows a lot of um, uh, Indonesians or, or even uh, Thailand or in Malaysia uh, or in some part of China, where in remote areas, they could actually do e-commerce from there. So I think uh, this is a, a very, very big uh, booming uh, market there. Food and beverages are naturally in Asia, yeah. Asians just love food and uh, beverage. So this is another fastest growing uh, industry. And because of the booming um, e-commerce and the uh, improvement of transportation in, in Asia, delivery and logistics is also another booming sector uh, in this uh, region, yeah. So what is to be expected in the next 20 years? So e-commerce will definitely be still rapidly go, uh, growing. Yeah, but there are a lot of digital platforms out there in Asia, especially in ASEAN in the region, Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, all these areas, uh, they have very, very big e-commerce presence. Another one is uh, the big uh, one is FinTech. Yeah, FinTech, especially in countries like uh, Singapore, they have a lot of uh, FinTech license being issued in uh, Singapore and also a lot of technologies being, um, let's just put, uh, put it this way, platforms that are developed there. In some part, also in Malaysia, Malaysia has, I think, recently gave out a banking license for FinTechs, yeah, online banks uh, in Malaysia. And uh, the next one that is going to still be there for the years is definitely manufacturing infrastructure. Yeah, infrastructure for ASEAN countries is really driving at the uh, 
at the moment, the growth in uh, ASEAN, uh, countries like um, Vietnam, Thailand, and uh, also uh, Indonesia. Infrastructure is uh, gaining momentum. I think uh, in Indonesia has just uh, built the high-speed train. Uh, I'm not, I can't remember it now from where, but it is built by the Chinese. Uh, this is a um, high-speed train that uh, connects, I think, Jakarta with one of the more busier uh, city in, uh, in the uh, Java Island. Service sector, service sector is also another big one. Healthcare, yeah, tourism, professional services, especially healthcare in Thailand. In Malaysia, it's definitely booming. It's booming now. In 20 years, I will still see it uh, booming, especially in terms of technology. It is uh, booming uh, for medical technology of, uh, in Malaysia, especially. Yeah. And automotive and manufacturing, this is also another biggest uh, fast growing sector, especially in Thailand. Uh, and uh, uh, due to the uh, the new uh, Eastern Economic Corridor near the Pattaya region. This is uh, where all the uh, manufacturing is uh, being based at the moment. Also in Indonesia, yeah, because uh, this is where most of the uh, raw materials for uh, automotive and manufacturing uh, can be found. Yeah. So after seeing all uh, all this, what are the challenges when you work? or when you want to scale up or when you want to do invest or even to uh, penetrate the markets in Asia. First of all, you must understand that um, Asia is not just China or Japan. Even China and Japan itself is very different from one another. It's a very diverse. Customs are different. Traditions are different. Practices are different. Yeah, The languages, it is as diverse as it is in, uh, in Europe. We, we speak multiple languages there. Even in Malaysia alone, uh, you know, children speak at least three languages by the time they are five, you know, because they are, it's so multicultural uh, and everything. So communications etiquette is different from one uh, to, to the other. Even in China itself, you know, it's a very big country. From, from the north to the south, it's not the same. You know, what we like to eat, what, uh, what we practice the cultures are even a little bit more different, yeah. And adopt, adapting to the local culture is definitely very, very, very important. Yeah, legal and regulatory is another one, yeah. Must actually understand the legal framework in each country. What are the bureaucratic processes that you have to know? What are the compliance issues that you have? Yeah, navigating this um, is very, very uh, challenging, time consuming, so that you have to also take into mind, yeah. And market entry strategies. So you must actually identify the right market to enter. To, to say that you want to expand into Asia, it's, it's good. But where in Asia, it's very important. Because you need to factor in such as demand, where's your supply chain is going to be, yeah, how is the competition going to be there. Yeah, and also, if you have uh, going to be a joint venture, are you going in alone? Yeah, are you going to go on a partnership? All these considerations must be taken in and factored in before you move there. Because moving to Thailand is not the same as moving to Vietnam because uh, there are two many uh, very very different uh, countries. Or even to Malaysia, Malaysia speaks English, Thai speaks a little bit of English, but not as much as Malaysia. So this also you have to understand that. But Malaysia is cheaper than Singapore. So all these factors you must take into consideration before you uh, venture into Asia. Yeah. But after seeing the, uh, about the challenges, so what could uh, the benefits be? Naturally, of course, the booming markets. Yeah. It is one, as I have explained before, it is one of the world's fastest growing economies. The, uh, pop uh, the young population, the uh, the working uh, working the working how do you say that uh, the working middle class is there the put that therefore the purchasing power is immense so if you are into um, how do you say that the consumer goods and everything this is definitely the market to uh, to, uh, to look at um, especially into the uh, Southeast Asian market or the South Asian market yeah and cost efficiency. So labor, in terms of uh, cost advantage, definitely labor, yeah? 
OPEX is another one that uh, you could uh, uh, benefit from it. So something that uh, you know, everybody knows that, uh, for example, a lot of uh, call centers or even uh, support centers are in uh, India, but uh, now they are moving to, um, you, not, you might not believe it, into Cambodia. Yeah, Cambodia is also a very, very good uh, uh, IT support, uh, Philippines. That's also because the labor and the pro uh, production uh, Cost is very low there, very high uh, level of education. Yeah. So for manufacturing too, yeah, outsourcing operations, like, like I said, uh, especially for IT, think about the uh, Philippines, think about uh, Cambodia, think about uh, Malaysia. These are the countries that are still cheap enough to um, uh, move outsourcing there. In terms of uh, innovation and technology, yeah, Asia is definitely in the forefront of uh, technological advancement. Um, countries like China, they have very, very uh, advanced technology. Yeah. Uh, also, uh, in terms of uh, fintech, um, like uh, Singapore and Malaysia, they are also leading in terms of that. Yeah. And uh, definitely cutting it, uh, edge technology. They have invested a lot of money into uh, R and D in Hong Kong, especially. They are uh, looking into uh, incubating a lot of. Uh, uh, startups into in the uh, deep tech uh, region, yeah. So they are very supportive. Uh, in the, I think uh, in terms of investment and time into helping all these startups work, and strategic partnership, obviously, uh, yeah, to uh, to reach a market. It's a uh, it's very important to maybe have a very good uh, strategic partnerships with uh, local expertise. For even for us uh, at Silco, we always partner with uh, with local uh, companies, yeah, because we believe that people are on the ground. That means the people that are in the country who know best. So what is the what is the uh, how the strategy should be? Who you should uh, join with, or if it's possible or not to actually expand the market from there. Yeah, that is very important. And obviously, joint ventures and uh, alliances will definitely uh, facilitate the knowledge uh, exchange. I have done that before, uh, from Europe to Asia, uh, East Asia, uh, East Asia. So like China, Korea, Japan, and also the other way around, like Koreans to uh, European markets. So that uh, that you can actually beneficially uh, and mutually grow uh, together. Yeah. So that's it from me. Uh, back to you, uh, Tobias. Yeah, thank you very much, Yungsi, for this interesting summary and introduction. That brings us to the second part of today's webinar. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Tobias. Uh, thank you for uh, having me. And good uh, afternoon or evening or even morning for those who are present. I don't know exactly in which time zone uh, you are. Uh, is my slide visible, my first slide? No, we, we cannot see it. Then uh, let me see. There we go. Now it should be okay, right? Perfect. Yes, perfect. Yes, okay, good. Uh, let me introduce my myself, uh, Charles. I'm a, a co-founder of uh, and, and director of a company called uh, Pointed International uh, Limited in, in Hong Kong. That's a company that uh, develops uh, rainware. Let me see whether my, my slides are moving. Yes, there we go. Uh, you see I'm in Hong Kong. So we develop rainware and we develop bicycle bags. We develop that in Hong Kong. We let it be manufactured on the Chinese mainland. 25 years ago, that was mostly in the Guangdong province. Later, it moved to the north, and now it's moving southward again. Later, uh, during the q and I can come back on that. And uh, before uh, 2019, I was already uh, used to make speeches about the advantages of doing business in, in, in Hong Kong. And I mentioned all those advantages that you, and also during Q&A sessions, no questions were asked about politics, about disadvantages of doing business in Hong Kong. We, we didn't have all this. So 
Today, my presentation is going to be a bit different because we are no longer before COVID. We are no longer before uh, the uh, unrest in 2019. This is a new, new era. So my presentation today consists of three parts. Uh, the, um, to show you how the situation in Hong Kong has evolved over the past uh, six years, I, I sh show you first how my presentation would have been uh, if we would have been, still been in 2018. Then I will elaborate on how the Hong Kong Trade Development Council, uh, Leon mentioned the Hong Kong Trade Development Council also already, I will elaborate on how the Hong Kong Trade Development Council currently promotes Hong Kong to businesses overseas. And then the third part will be my personal assessment of the current business climate in, in Hong Kong. How would I present Hong Kong before the unrest in 2019 and before the COVID pandemic? I would say, is an environment where rule of law reigns. There is a simple taxation system with low taxes. Employment for everyone and a stable labor market. A good attitude to labor. A multilingual environment. Hong Kong is home to some of the most important trade shows on earth. It's a prime location for inter international conferences and seminars. This was a recent banking seminar. It's a, it cannot be denied, it's a, it's, a, it's a very cosmopolitan city. Yeah, here you see a, a, a slide, a picture taken from Hong Kong Island with the new M plus contemporary art museum. But it's not only about uh, museum, there's a wide variety of entertainment uh, facilities where you can unwind. This is uh, the um, Asia World Expo next to Hong Kong Airport. Definitely there is high quality and affordable uh, healthcare. And I can, I can uh, confirm that because I have been in this machine. And then, it's a convenient geographic uh, location in Asia. You see how much this is in the center. And still, albeit uh, no longer over 70%, 69% to be precise, uh, still home to a lot of nature, plenty of nature. What was uh, lacking in those days in, 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 the, in, the, in the years 2000, 2010, was environmental protection, recycling, uh, energy saving measures, not really. Uh, clean air was an issue. Clean water was an issue, especially along the shores. And uh, last but not least, air pollution. Uh, apart from the air quality, which has gone up, uh, most of these issues still exist. Now, these uh, um, observations mostly um, corresponded with the promotional campaigns of the Hong Kong Trade Development Council in those days. Actually, it was very easy to promote Hong Kong because it, it, it was definitely a very nice place to do business in. So it was, it was an easy job. So now things have, have changed and let, let us see now how the um, Hong Kong Trade Development Council is doing the promotional job for Hong Kong now. And then you see what they say. They say there's rule of law, there's free trade, uh, free investment policy, um, there's a, a very good, very efficient financial market, there's free, free flow of information, goods, capital and people. The low and simple tax system is there. It's a, it's a tax friendly environment. Uh, the the legal protection is there. It's the only city, Chinese city that practices common law, understandable, seen the history. Uh, it has a world-class infrastructure with uh, very sophisticated support services. Uh, 
later I will come back on that. It's definitely true. And obviously, uh, Hong Kong remains close to mainland China and to the wider Asia region. But there's something is new because Hong Kong Trade Development Council used to mention all those advantages from, from their own. And now suddenly they uh, mention something else in addition. They uh, mention the um, China um, five-year plan and what Beijing actually sees as an, uh, an uh, important for Hong Kong's uh, development in eight areas, financial center, transportation center, trade center, a place um, that is legally uh, safe, a good place to do uh, um, uh, deal making, uh, uh, a place where you can resolve your disputes if you have them, uh, definitely an aviation hub, an innovation and technology center, that's definitely one of their, of their um, uh, promotional points. Uh, East, East, East meets West Center for uh, International Cultural Exchange. Cultural exchange is definitely important. Uh, the Hong Kong government has invested a lot of money in new museum. Yeah. And then finally, a um, uh, trading center for intellectual property. And that brings me then to the third part of my presentation, my own assessment. And yeah, there uh, things are sometimes a little bit uh, different. Uh, and I start very positive. The infrastructure, infrastructure in and out of Hong Kong has improved a lot in the past uh, five years. And uh, very soon the uh, capacity of Hong Kong International Airport will increase with the third run runway. Actually that third runway is already there, but they are now renovating the second runway. So that's why we only have two runways in use. Uh, we, we got a lot new, uh, highways, six lane highways to the mainland and to Macau. Uh, they are hardly used. They look like white elephants. Um, it's, it's a matter of only thousands of cars that have the, the permit to travel by car from Hong Kong to Macau and Zhuhai, for instance, although it is a wonderful, magnificent bridge. The geographical location, of course, is, yeah, that, that was already there and that obviously that has not, uh, not changed. Hong Kong has virtually no import duties, uh, except on, on cigarettes and uh, strong alcoholic uh, beverage and, uh, and so on. And Hong Kong, of course, has no VAT. There's no capital gain tax. Opening a company is very, still a very easy thing to do. The um, uh, opening of a banking account has become a lot more difficult. That's really not easy. The financial sector is one of the pillars still of the Hong Kong economy. It's not my field of business, but I have no reason to believe that Hong Kong's role as a financial center in the world is declining. The environment of Hong Kong has not significantly is not significantly uh, changed over the over the past six years. Hong Kong is still home to a lot of country parks, and not not many uh, uh, infrastructural projects are, are destroying uh, Hong Kong's beautiful nature. And uh, coming back on the on the healthcare system, uh, we have that that system of a public and private uh, healthcare that remains unchanged. Hong Kong is still a vibrant uh, city with uh, lots of entertainment options. However, things are slowly changing. The hangout area of Lang Kwai Fong is no longer what it was before. Restaurants in Hong Kong are closing earlier than before. This is not something that you see in the newspapers. That is some, not something that you that you uh, uh, see uh, uh, on the signs, but you feel it 
when you are hungry at, at nine o'clock, 9.30, then you think, hey, but in the past, we could still go out and now we have to, to look for something. The um, working environment, as far as I'm concerned, the working environment has not changed significantly. I mean, Hong Kong people are hardworking people. And this mentality, this, this dual mentality has not, not changed. Conferences and, and seminars are uh, coming back. The Hong Kong government is actively promoting that, uh, promoting that the uh, major international conferences and seminars are being held in Hong Kong again, and they also put a lot of money in that. And with respect to, to um, the, the labor attitude, I also see no, no changes. The uh, tax system has not changed yet. And uh, of course, there are always minuscule changes, but uh, basically there's still no VAT. However, the Hong Kong government is now facing a bitter reality of serious business deficits. And something that was very unusual previously. And it remains to be seen for how long the Hong Kong government will allow this kind of deficits to occur. I see already, for instance, that uh, the Hong Kong police is much more active in giving out parking tickets. Now, that doesn't, that doesn't make much sense because a parking ticket costs about 35 euros. Uh, but but we, we see changes, uh, various departments start scrambling already a little bit. And uh, let me see. Uh, yes, the labor market has changed. There are definitely less foreigners in the city, although it is not clear how many less? We know that many friends have were left, left the city. And we also uh, uh, are lacking information from the Hong Kong government because they do no longer uh, share statistics with the various consulates general uh, from Western Europe. So we don't actually, we don't know how many Dutch, how many French, how many uh, uh, Belgians, how many Germans are in, in, in Hong Kong. Hong Kong was and remains a city where English is accepted as the official language. The command of English is declining due to changes in the education system that took place quite some time ago already, and due to the arrival of new residents from mainland China. Every day, 150 families. Every day, every day, every day. For um, businesses, commercial disputes, etc., the rule of law applies. For criminal cases related to what is called national security and cases against the Hong Kong government, the situation is more complicated. The red line has been drawn by the national security law of Hong Kong, which was promulgated announced uh, on the 30th of June uh, 2020 at 11 o'clock in the evening and one hour later it took effect and although the line is not always clear you will not be affected by it if you stay away from the activities mentioned in it such as well very tough things secession subversion terrorist activities and what they call colluding with foreign forces. But the question is then, what is a foreign force? Am I a foreign force as a, as a 30 year uh, a permanent resident in Hong Kong? After COVID, most of the trade shows, but not all, have resumed. But the number of buying foreign visitors has declined. This also applies to the trade shows on the Chinese, Chinese mainland, uh, by the way, such as the uh, Canton Fair in Guangzhou. 
on my slide uh, uh, point 15, uh, sorry, 16, last one, the free flow of information, goods, capital, and people. Information. In Hong Kong, the access to websites, Western European websites, is more complicated. That has nothing to do with Hong Kong, that has nothing to do with China directly. Uh, they are blocked by providers in Europe or by website owners in Europe. Maybe to avoid hacking, but the fact is that we have less access to uh, European uh, websites than, than people in, in Western Europe. Likewise, the um, access to apps is blocked. So Western European apps, Western European uh, uh, apps are not always accessible or cannot be downloaded, cannot be seen in, in uh, Google Play uh, for the same reason. The press landscape has definitely changed. Uh, the freedom of expression is limited. Uh, if it doesn't please the mainland Chinese authorities. The free flow of goods remain, remains unchanged. The free flow of capital is not my area, but I experience no changes except that, for instance, HSBC is no longer in a, in a present in a country like France. So, uh, transfers um, in, in, in that way between different HSBC offices is, are no longer possible. A free flow of people, finally. In principle, there are no changes, but the Hong Kong government is no longer recognizing the British BNO passport as a valid travel document. That means that the Hong Kong government has more power over the freedom to leave the country for those who were born before the 1st of July, 1997, and who are also then a holder of a BNO passport. This uh, ends the third and the last part of my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And during the Q&A session, please, feel free to ask the most practical questions about very practical issues that you face. For instance, how is the travel between Hong Kong and, and mainland China? Or my factory has uh, lowered the quality of uh, the goods that, I, that they produce for me. What shall I do? Yeah. Uh, Mario, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Liung C and Charles, for these interesting insights. Perhaps I start with my questions. Or very, very interesting. Also, Liung C, your point that, of course, especially due to China and India, there is a growing consumer class in Asia, and also I think countries like Vietnam, which just like for some people still are associated to some cloth clothing and textile manufacturing i think they are heading towards being part of the g20 also in a in a in a really relatively short time how do you see so you you mentioned that it is cheap enough to move outsourcing there whilst i think also in europe there is some kind of after covid um, also for the geopolitical challenges and um, conflict in the U Ukraine, there's some tendency of, of, of going into the tendency of nearshoring in some European countries. So how do you explain this to, to your customers, the advantages of, of Asia, this big market on the one hand, whilst of course a very fragmented space of a lot of languages, a lot of cultures, and of course also some with some challenges in, let's say, in the geopolitical setting like like China for the moment, for instance? I think in this case, most, I think we have to separate these two, yeah? Business and politics, sometimes what they speak in uh, politics is not going to go in, trickle into business, yeah? Sometimes, you know, 
people, uh, I see Americans still working and doing business with China. So, you know, so it must be separated uh, in that sense, geopolitical wise. <clears throat> in terms of uh, markets, I think you also must also understand, like I said before, that you must know what your product is, which is your target market. And how, like for example, we have uh, uh, a, a product that is in water. So uh, in, in terms of water, where do you think is the best place to, to package it? Yeah, would it, we, we actually thought uh, the biggest or the best place to package is actually in, in China, in Hainan. But then we found out during COVID, it's not, not a bad, best idea, you know? And then we move it to Thailand. Why Thailand? So you must do your homework, due diligence, very important. Business uh, research, market research, all these are very important. You must know first who your target uh, clients are. In, uh, in the terms of the water, the target uh, clients are the mega cities. So where are the mega cities? India, uh, China, you know, Indonesia, Thailand. So when we ch uh, chose Thailand, it's because they have like a, uh, trains that goes from Thailand all the way to China. And that is the crossroad between China, Asia, and uh, and uh, and Europe. There is a train that goes from China to Europe. And uh, from there, it goes down south to Southeast Asia. Nobody really knows that. So this is the uh, homework you have to do before you do that. This is uh, the supply chain, what happens when the ship doesn't move. So this, I think uh, due diligence is very important. You have to do your research before you move in, either to sell your products or even start maybe production or manufacturing there. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I can uh, add to that, especially for the nears, uh, near shoring. I, I have tried my best to have manufacturing of the products that you see behind me in um, countries like Turkey, Georgia, Azerbaijan, uh, also Bulgaria, Poland, and time and again, when, when I, I, I received the quotations from factories, they are so much more expensive than, uh, than the quotations from mainland China uh, factories. It's impossible to compete. Even if the containers have a lot of delay and have to go around South Africa, and we have to pay 8,000 US dollar for a 40 feet container, even if we pay 10% import duty, even if the production time is, is, is long, it's all so much more competitive. Uh, our customers and the consumers in general expect this from us to happen. Mm -hmm. So we can talk uh, about, about the risking, but decoupling is not an easy thing to do. Almost impossible. It's really almost impossible. <laughs> it's also I, at least I don't see how I don't see how yeah. to do it. While 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 we had Chinese staff doing sourcing in 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 Turkey, mind you, and yes. it was it was simply not working. Yeah, true. Very, very interesting insight. Charles also can confirm this. I've been working in the pharmaceutical sector for, for several years and basically also there all the manufacturing takes place in India while it's also considerable part is meanwhile done in, in China, especially for, for raw materials for intermediates. And first hand, it's, it's very much more cost cost competitive in, in Asia. At the same time, there's also not the capacities anymore in Europe to, to manufacture these pro, pro, products. So basically for the healthcare systems, putting a lot of cost pressure on the on the medication. So I think European companies just have moved these manufacturing capabilities to, to Far East and there is no manufacturing capabilities left in inside Europe. Perhaps another question to you, Charles. So once you look at the news, of course, over the last years in, in Hong Kong, it's some kind of perceived, I think, from the Western perspective as some kind of, let's say, unsecure, um, perhaps as people are, are demonstrating on, on, on the street for their for their right um, or citizen rights that perhaps they, they do not have anymore. 
so I know it quite well. Also, my, for instance, my wife is from Colombia, so I know also this perception of, let's say, the public perception of Colombia and the perceived perception when you know the country. So I think perhaps something very similar happens in Hong Kong, and would be quite interested. What's your opinion on on that? Oh, it's it's very interesting to see that from a Western perspective, we lost certain rights. But when I came when I came to Hong Kong in 1994 under British rule, there was no democracy whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. So then uh, uh, I, I was wondering what, what is lost then, because it has never been there. It's yeah? true. It's so true. Su suddenly, suddenly uh, we are talking about, about uh, certain rights that certain people claim to, to have or, or to lose, but they never had it. It's true. What's the what's the point? You cannot lose something that you never had before. You know. <laughs> so, I mean, it's ridiculous to say that. You know, it's like a, when the British was ruling, everything was run by the British. And there's no way of you going up anywhere. You know, and you know, I I don't know what can be lost when you don't have it before. You know. <laughs> if you don't have it in the first place, how can you lose it? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, I don't I don't see that that point so much yeah mm, but what, what I see is uh, after the the unrest that we had in uh, 2019 uh, we got a, 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 of course a, a, an, 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 an intervention from uh, Hong Kong police uh, supported by by Beijing and it was all uh, with uh, violent clashes but in the end we had a quiet environment again the public transportation was no longer disrupted we could uh, uh, visit friends and relatives whenever we wanted uh, staff could go back to the office like normal we had weeks and weeks that that we had uh, staff who couldn't come to the office because they, on the way, they may may get tear gas in their eyes. Yeah. No. So all this now is unthinkable, and I can say uh, even if there's some some uh, dissent on uh, political choices, the environment as such, and uh, Long Si can can uh, can confirm that you have been in Hong Kong recently. Mm. It's it's a very peaceful environment. Yes. Yeah? We go out, we go to concerts, we go uh, shopping, uh, we, have a, we have a great life there. Exactly. Life is like uh, in Europe, apart from the fact that everything opens on a Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> and until 11 p.m., by the way. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is, this is uh, getting a little bit earlier. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. I in, think so in too. Return, in the return, uh, now, now um, a travel between Hong Kong, mainland China, and Macau has become so easy yeah. that and um, Shenzhen and Macau have also become big entertainment centers mm -hmm. that people go out for an evening to to Shenzhen or they go out for Macau, Macau mm -hmm. much much more easily than before. Yes, it's true. It's true. I mean, even for me, you know. For, from from Hong Kong to Shanghai with a high speed train via Shenzhen, yes. oh, that is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Does that answer your question, Mario? This answers my question very well. Thank you so much. Perhaps handing over to Tobias, as he also had some some questions. Yes, you've already mentioned the buzzwords um, de-risking and um, nearshoring. And according to my point of view, our experience right now, Mexico is one of the greatest profiteers of the nearshoring boom worldwide to, to, to the uh, near location to the US. And of course, the, the free trade agreement with the US and uh, Canada. Do you see any profit here in, in the Asian region for from this nearshoring or uh, de-risking strategy? Or is there none? The question to me or to yeah. both of you? Chelsea, you go first. Okay. Uh, yes, of course, in, in, in Mexico, we have that phenomenon already for a long time called mm -hmm. maquiladoras, which is a uh, um, subcontraction of uh, mm -hmm. 
manufacturing in um, in Mexico. It started uh, especially with the uh, automotive uh, industry. And uh, one would say that such a model could be working for Western Europe. When we look at Eastern Europe, when we look at uh, uh, um, Turkey, for instance. So I have done my research. I went to all those countries and I talked to factories and I don't see how it works. So uh, being in, 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 in Hong Kong, uh, I understand that, that uh, system of uh, nearshoring, but as I mentioned before, I don't see it happening. The, uh, the factory managers or the, the, the factory bosses I talk to in the places where you would expect nearshoring, they are lacking a motivated workforce. Um, we see ladies in a factory the whole, all the time playing with their phone, yeah, taking a lot of breaks. And when the boss turns his uh, back, then immediately the, 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 the production slows down. The knowledge is often not there. All the, all the knowledge for manufacturing my products, which are not extremely complicated products, but still, uh, you need some, some, some knowledge. That knowledge is widely available there at all levels, at management level, logistics, procurement, manufacturing, it's all there. And in, 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 for nearshoring, too many elements are, 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 are lacking. And of course, it's nice to think, oh, well, I can, I can manufacture uh, a 24 hours drive uh, from Germany. I don't, for, at least for my products, I don't see it happen. Yeah. And uh, I'm, basically, I'm doing textile. Well, if, if it doesn't work for me, then I think for many other people, it also doesn't work. Yeah, in terms of manufacturing, I agree yeah, with so you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. so so oh. I, I elaborated already on the near shoring. So the risking, yes, definitely. I I I've also been been thinking about that. I think yeah, uh, it makes no sense to to de risk because uh, even if uh, uh, political events make uh, the uh, cooperation between Western Europe and China difficult or very difficult, Europe cannot do without. You know how much, uh, uh, coming back on the on the pharmaceutical sector, how much paracetamol uh, um, raw materials, uh, ingredients are made in China. I think 90% or 95% of all paracetamol is made in China. There you go. Yeah, you cannot... You cannot stop that so easily. You cannot say, oh, I, I build a new factory and the next next year in, 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 in Ludwigshafen, we have a new factory who's making all the paracetamol for, for Western Europe. It doesn't work like that. Yes. Definitely agree on that one. I mean, it takes time to build new factories, to, to teach people to make it, or, or even, you know, a lot of factors bring in, like for example, in Germany, the energy factor comes in, you know, I, I know a lot of automation companies, they come to us and it says, you know, we cannot sustain here. We have to go somewhere else. Where else can they go to? You need somewhere where they have a uh, very good technology, the educated, uh, uh, how do you say that, uh, workforce, you know, and that could uh, easily take over this job in, in, in Germany. And where do you go to? They go to Asia, you know, so it's always like this, yeah. So as like uh, for 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 example, when you said about uh, you know uh, America, they are buying now from the uh, the uh, the Mexican. It's true. I I, I agree with uh, with uh, Charles uh, with regards to the mentality of workers because you know Asian workers work differently than how European would work or even how African anybody would work. Most of the time, the mentality is that. I have a task, I must finish it. I don't care uh, how long it takes me. 
you know, they would never put down the pen and say, I have a work-life balance. They would tell you, you know, th there is no such thing. They were like, I have to finish this task. This task is mine and mine alone. So yeah, this is the mentality that uh, it, it's very hard to replace. You know, this, I think in the near run, mm, it's very, very difficult. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And thanks also for adding the intercultural perspective, which is very, very important also in that context. And for sure, uh, to to shift your production from even from one country to a neighboring country, this is not an easy decision. And also within the company, this could take months or even years to, to take this decision because it requires a lot of uh, commitment, financial resources, workforce training or other factors you've just mentioned yeah i can i can imagine that people like to move manufacturing for instance from mainland china to vietnam mm -hmm. in theory this is possible but it doesn't mean that you de-risk and it doesn't mean that you do a uh, decoupling because the raw materials still come from mainland china also, also uh, the, the, the type of manufacturing that you can uh, move to Vietnam is different. You know, you cannot move high technology, high tech industries to Vietnam. They don't have the capability nor the education yet so far to take over. I mean, aviation is no way it's going to go to Vietnam. Maybe clothing, yes. Yeah. Maybe manufacturing of uh, plastic goods, yes. But manufacturing of certain components it is not possible. No. Not yet, at least. Yeah. Perhaps another question in, in this direction of the of high technologies. I think um, let's say a common concern European companies always have about you know, about Asia is the, the intellectual property, the protection of intellectual property rights. What's your take on on this, perhaps, Leung Si? I mean, for us, usually uh, this is where Hong Kong comes in play. Yeah, For those who are very fearful of China, of, of stealing of intellectual property rights and everything, we always go to Hong Kong. And be, the reason uh, for it is because of the common law. That means, uh, you know, and for the Chinese, they feel uh, much more, how do you say that, in, in terms of working together with China. The Chinese would also like to see you in Hong Kong because they feel comfortable there. The Europeans or the Western part of the world feel comfortable there because they are still operating in, uh, in uh, under common law. And, uh, you know, I think Hong Kong is definitely, like Charles said, it's a very, very good place to make money for the Chinese too, and also for the Europeans. It keeps their uh, patent safe. I always tell my clients, if you, are, you know, if you are afraid, let's just keep it in Hong Kong. Yeah. And also the reason why for Hong Kong is because, now think about it, where would the world want to buy in terms of marketing? Would you say the goods that come from Hong Kong? Made in China, nobody cares, but it's from Hong Kong, you know. So this is also another way of uh, doing business. So for for uh, for for intellectual property, definitely in Hong Kong, but in China, I think it's a slowly changing. The mentality is changing. I have seen a lot of Chinese company now filing for patents because they don't want them to be stolen either. You know, it goes both ways. You know, because now they are. We work a lot in deep tech, and now they are filing patents more than the Europeans are filing at the moment, even more than the Japanese. So if you think in maybe next 10 years or so, I think maybe they are the biggest filer of uh, IPs. Yeah. Yeah, the Hong Kong government has also made arrangements so that um, patent lawyers and lawyers in general can now practice across the border on the mainland. So there's a transfer of knowledge going on. So with Hong Kong is a starting point and working with an office that uh, employs lawyers that can go to the mainland directly, which has been facilitated by the mainland Chinese authorities. Hong Kong is a very good starting point. Exactly, exactly. I mean, everybody feels comfortable there from the East and from the West, you know. Also for us, a spring uh, springboard towards Southeast Asia because uh, for even for the Chinese government, going to Southeast Asia is actually quite quite a very good uh, lucrative uh, plan. 
because it is, after all, a growing population, 30% of the world population, yeah. Looking at the time, I think we can summarize that in, I think we agree that Asia will have a growing growing importance in, in business for population growth, for for location in the world, of course, for dominance in, in certain technologies. So I think all of us, we have to look at doing business in Asia. Thank you very much for your participation today. And we are much looking forward also to arrange for, for individual conversations afterwards with with some of our customers who might have an interest to to look deeper at the the topic so thank you very much Liam C and Charles for being our our guest today thank you it was my pleasure